uh, when we were chatting with various employers uh, during the, the lockdown and what was the, their feeling about the employee perceptions and that the lockdown was merely similar to an annual shutdown or annual leave and when they come back to the workplace everything is going to be absolutely uh, the same as it was um, you know, previously. And as we will see when we go through our, our conversation today, uh, the world has actually changed absolutely upside down and P uh, the world of work is going to become very, very people centric. I mean, it always was, but I think it'll be much, much more um, you know, pronounced. Um, so uh, Baruch is the conversation that we will have today, um, you know, setting the overall scene I think linking the what we do in terms of the various plans uh, that we've got to do in terms of regulations, et cetera, we must contextualize that within the business framework and the impact that this has on the supply and demand of employees. We'll deal with a range of, um, of HR issues and legal issues as we go through. And right at the very end, we'll just give you a summary of the uh, various proclamations and other activities that you need to do. Jakes, would you like to ask this question here? Jake, your microphone's off. Yeah. 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 You can hear me now. Sorry about that. Yeah. I think I think in your in your opening, Mike, you indicated that uh, the world has changed upside down, and and I think most of us sitting here today know exactly that there's been fundamental changes in the world of work and our personal lives and and in general. Uh, but I think what is more important is is to concentrate on what will change over the next uh, short to medium term uh, period. Uh, maybe you can you can uh, share some insight into that, uh, Mike. Yeah, I think we. I mean, we will do it um, in in more detail um, in, uh, later on. Um, I think we must. What the point of um, this is to say, let's go beyond uh, level four um, and let's look into the rest of the year. Um, and it would be interesting just to find out from uh, participants when they expect us to get to level one. Um, yes. We could have asked that, um, that, that as, a, as a question, but um, a number of businesses that we've interacted with, uh, Seed Level 1 is an event probably in January, even February next year. So we've got another six, seven months of uh, lockdowns in some form or other. Okay, let's go on to the next slide there. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, I think what um, um, we've highlighted here and part of our individual assessment is the um, what impact has the lockdown had on your business, not only in an immediate sense, but also going forward. And if one looks at the uh, items under the process or event, um, what do we expect the rest of the year to look like? Um, and will we have a quick bounce back or would it be a slow uh, bounce back? Or if we're unfortunate to be in something like the tourism or accommodation section uh, sector, when will um, business even start to return? Um, and I think we've all had the, not all of us, but some of us would have had experience where people's businesses have literally disappeared overnight. Um, I think of people in the, uh, architectural business where building has come to a standstill all the way through to yes programs on the border of the Kruger Park that were uh, doing aquaponics uh, and feeding into the various uh, um, uh, lodges um, and all of that business is gone so it's not only the big person that suffered but also the very small um, businesses that have um, impacted um, and it's going to change uh, I think for our employees one of the issues that um, we'd ask ourselves to, to be sensitive to that when employees are anxious, and I think the societal pain with the lockdown, it would have produced a lot of fears and anxieties. People lose focus on health and safety in the workplace. And there's a lot of research that evidences that. So I think when employees do come back to, to work, I think it's important for us to just engage with them, find out where they are, what impact it has had, uh, what difficulties they're facing, and to what extent we might be able to support them. Okay. Um, and then I think the last item under what has changed in the workplace, one of the key questions for us to ask is what has changed in the relationships between the employer and the employee? Um, Jake, I don't know if you've got any comments you'd like to share in that regard. Yes, uh, Mike, I think, I think it goes without saying uh, we've had, uh, uh, you know, whatever the relationship was prior to COVID or the lockdown per se, um, will that continue, you know, whatever the sense might be? 
Uh, one of the aspects that we've been talking to, uh, to fellow employers is how you treat employees during the lockdown is going to determine your relationship going forward with those employees. And, and a simple phone call or, or, or just to touch base uh, could have a huge impact in that relationship of caring and to find out how their families are. Because remember, this, this is unprecedented. Um, so those relationships uh, uh, that, that, that have been built for over some time uh, will be really tested during this particular period and going forward, Mike. And, and more especially, not just employees, we're talking about all stakeholders, such as your unions, um, your, your customers, and your, your, your suppliers, for that matter. So, you know, that's going to be pivotal in making your business either uh, 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 fly or fold at the end of the day. Yeah, super. Yeah, thanks, Jakes. Jakes, would you lead the conversation on this? Yes, uh, Mike. I think I think uh, you know the term "bounce back" uh, is 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 uh, is quite critical here in the sense that um, you know we need to get back to normal, whatever that means, and operating within the new normal. Um, and and how quick uh, and and in what format we bounce back uh, uh, is really going to determine the future of the business. Is going to determine um, the environment we're operating in, etc. So what we've given is that if we have to take the normal uh, 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 curves that uh, economists use in terms of GDP uh, growth and, and behavioral patterns, uh, we look at the V, U, L, and W uh, 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 graphs or, or, or bounce back routines uh, based on time against economic activity. And, and you could use that in terms of your business activity as well. It's very simple. Um, you know, now that we've all dropped, uh, if you take the V-shape and just, just very quickly, uh, how quick are we going to be bouncing back? How quick are we going to be uh, seeing the, the, the turn of the ship at the end of the day? So if you're in a V-shaped curve, um, great, you know, then, then you, you, you went down and you're coming back very quickly. Uh, and if you're in a U-shape, that means you've got a, a longer trough. Um, that means your bounce back uh, to, to come back to, to normality will, will take a bit longer. Uh, your W is basically in a very uh, uncertain market where you will, you'll be bouncing all over the shore, up and down. Um, and then you've got your L shape, which is more a very long trough. And, and, and then you see a slight turn towards the positive. So one needs to take all the dynamics of the business and, and, and try and, and plot them into to, into a particular way, the way the, the business is going to behave and what's the recovery period is going to be. Based on that, uh, you can then determine what type of actions you take with your people. For example, if, if you have uh, predicted in your analysis and your planning and, and scenario planning for that matter, that your business is going to have a V-shaped uh, uh, bounce back, then, um, you know, retrenching employees and, and sending people home is not is a big no, no, because you're going to need them at the end of the day. So skills retention, change in remuneration structure towards the positive um, and, and, and high recruitment is, is where you're going to be heading. Should you be, uh, for example, in the L shape, that means it's going to take a bit of time, which is more like the South African economy than anything else. And you foresee that your business will only uh, tend to recover based on everything uh, within a 12-month period and beyond, uh, then, then you're going to take a very different approach in terms of uh, downsizing, but not downsizing to a major major lot, but enough to keep your, your, your business going. Your recruitment is going to come to a total standstill, um, and, and you're going to have a very lean, mean organization that's going to weather the storm until such time that you see the turn of events. Uh, towards the positive. So it's a very simplified model, but it's very effective in terms of determining how your business is going to behave, what are the environmental factors that's going to impact on it, your planning, and how you're going to actually take uh, the people agenda on in terms of, of uh, understanding what to do with people from a compensation, from a recruitment, from a training point of view, skills retention. So all that will inform you in terms of, of what to do with your people. If you can determine the way your business is going to go in the next, um, you know, short to medium to long term. Okay. The, uh, Jake, thanks for that. If I can just add a, uh, uh, 
we summarize that the this model uh, tells us about this the demand for for labor um, the time frames um, your V is probably about a three month scenario uh, and here you, what you want to do is to keep your team together the U shaped is probably three to six months uh, there'll be a, a, a period of quietness so what you're wanting to do is still keep in touch with your employees but perhaps go on to that training layoff scheme the w is up and down so you want lots of flexibility from your staff um, and adaptability but not a lot of uncertainty and then the l shape is probably very uncertain looking at at uh, nine to twelve months or even beyond that okay that's great yes what the emphasis around this this slide is that uh, the Re-establishing our businesses has not been done before in the, in, and uh, the, the issues that we're facing, we haven't experienced before. So the question that we asked ourselves is, how do we go about approaching something that we haven't done before? And uh, our feeling is we want to adopt a twofold process. Um, the one is to adopt the uh, values that are going to take us through this period of uncertainty. And we think the center one there is, is empathy. Um, and the defining of empathy is on the left-hand side of the uh, slide at the moment. Um, it's around care and compassion, but also in particular that your leadership style is one of uh, listening. And we're proposing that uh, in going ahead and managing change in the workplace and all the challenges we face, do, do it in an inclusive and participatory manner. And with a, a close attention to saying, if we do make managerial decisions, what impact is or could this have on stakeholders and ask for their opinion and input before we actually embark on that. And then this, carrying forward on the inclusivity to say we, we have urgency about change and the factors at the bottom of the slide and on the right hand side uh, talk to the project of managing change. And again, we are saying let's in, uh, involve employees. So go beyond your, your perhaps in a unionized environment, just dealing with uh, the unions, uh, but embrace all of employees, have them representative in the process. But urgency is absolutely needed here. And the one's got to move very, very quickly with the changes that need to be um, implemented. So what we're suggesting is to embark on a process of uh, identifying values, uh, empathy is certainly part of that, and conversational aspects associated with that, and then urgency about the process of change. Okay. Sorry, Jake, so do you have anything you wanted to add to that? No, I'm fine. Uh, I'm yeah. fine. It's yeah. covered, uh, Mike. Yeah. I, I think uh, we'll yeah. get to the EU champions just now. Um, yeah. that, is, that is quite uh, a significant yeah. move. Yeah, okay. Um, Going on to the, um, onto the next slide, uh, dealing with health and safety, um, the, if you look towards the bottom of the slide there, uh, I'm making the projection, or we are, that safeness and wellness is going to come the number one priority for employees um, and also for trade unions. And we're certainly seeing it with trade unions at the moment, a couple of court cases that have already been brought against employers with regard to health and safety um, you know, standards. Um, I think to, to focus on just on a broad aspect with health and um, safety, that first item there is that the focus is on changing behavior. The emphasis on under the um, legislation is to either eliminate or remove or mitigate uh, a risk and only uh, look at changing behaviors and particularly with the issue of PPE as a last resort. I think what we're facing with now is that changing behaviors becomes the first aspect. So it's a change in, in attention and focus. Um, I think the highlight the um, issue of non-compliance. What happens if your um, health and safety or COVID health and safety uh, program fails? Um, Jakes, would you like to just add to the, come in here on that one? Uh, what, what potential yes. impact could it have on the business? I, I think it's, 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 it's huge, especially taking the time uh, that we are faced right now, the circumstances. Um, and there's been directives from the Department of Labor, and, I've, and we've seen that, Mike, where they've indicated they're coming to, to, to conduct audits. Um, and, um, you know, there's, there's been uh, uh, two cases, in, in fact, that has been mentioned, and, and without going into companies' names, uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, that have manufacturing uh, within our, our midst. And, um, um, the, the, they both were suspected of, of having uh, some form of COVID uh, risk. And when the department went in, uh, the questions that were asked is, do you have a risk assessment uh, in terms of, of, of this particular situation? One said yes and one said no. And the one that said no was closed doors immediately. 
Uh, the one that Sevies went on to, 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 to prove that they were, you know, they, they, they had all the necessary controls in place and the measures, et cetera, et cetera. And they were, they were, they were told to continue with business because uh, they've taken all the necessary uh, 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 risk mitigation factors and controls and, and put all that in place, whereas the other uh, did not have the necessary documentation or the controls in place. And uh, the businesses were closed. And, uh, and that's the risk at the end of the day. So, you know, your business is at risk if you are non-compliant. Uh, government is taking a very, very uh, uh, hard, uh, hard line approach in this regard. Uh, but, but apart from government, I think it's a right thing to do, Mike. You know, you know yeah. let, let's, not, let's not lose focus on the side that we have a, have a joint responsibility in this together with employers. Uh, in ensuring that we comply and, and making sure that the people are safe. Yeah, super. Thanks, um, Jakes. And just to end off on the, the health and safety uh, parameters, uh, there have been a couple of court cases involving trade unions and employers. And um, the, in the one, one case, the, the claims brought by the trade union around um, the absence of PPE was uh, both uh, unsubstantiated and and frivolous, um, and the court or, uh, refused the uh, the application by the trade union, which was to interdict the um, employer, and they went on to remark that in this time, um, what is needed is collaboration, rather than adversarial behaviour, and the union was punished for that with a cost order. And I think it's just an alert to us: be very very sensitive to concerns of employees. Uh, the um, OSH um, uh, uh, requirements say that you must appoint a manager that can attend to employee concerns. That's a kind of internal expedited uh, grievance process uh, and employers are to set that up to communicate it and to uh, make sure that that uh, process is active and alert and uh, inclusive. So we need to build around collaboration on health and safety and convey that or transport it into other aspects of our HR issues. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. We can go on to the, the, the next two slides. Um, what um, this does is, is really just summarize the uh, proclamations that came out last week. The first one is the um, health and safety um, directives. And um, on all the um, health and safety items, I use the term, well, I will use the terminology, Directive 16.2. Whereas the, um, the uh, lockdown regulations going to uh, L4, uh, that proclamation is all about regulation. So if we use the term regulation 16.6, um, that will refer to that lockdown proclamation. So both of those uh, gazettes will be available to all of you um, later. Um, what I uh, wanted to share with you here, you can use uh, these two, this slide and, this, and the succeeding slide as a guide to what you need to do um, in developing your health and safety and your workplace readiness plans. And why I've put it up in this chart form is that you need to look at both documents simultaneously because there are aspects that are mentioned in both documents and you need to marry those in terms of your plans. Um, and um, so all the items on this page are spelled out there. We've made reference to the um, individual uh, paragraphs or um, items in those directives or uh, proclamations. And if we go on to the next slide, uh, we will see the, 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 the health and safety ones have a lot more detail, um, but there still is some um, overlap. Um, and uh, I think if there appears to be uh, a contradiction or you've got choices to be made, rather go the health and safety route uh, because there are some contradictions in the um, you know, material um, between the two. So just highlighting there the, your quick index, what you need to have in your plans, um, give effect to those, uh, check whether the, 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 if you're working on the health and safety, just check on the regulations if there's a corresponding item that you need to give attention to and, um, and vice versa. All right, we will come back to it a little bit later in more uh, detail around this. If we go to the next slide, please. Okay. All right, what, um, uh, just the framework of the COVID-19 uh, directives. Uh, it starts off with a requirement to have a risk assessment and develop the related uh, you know, policies around that. Um, the, 
And the second one is to appoint responsible people in the, in the broadest term within the workplace, um, to appoint a manager to uh, attend to work at concerns over health and safety. Um, this would be an additional appointment. Um, it is an expedited one, as I've mentioned. Um, I think it could be still be the responsible person that you've appointed under, uh, under the Act. And then in the regulations, um, they make two uh, references to compliance. They have a compliance employee, particularly in premises that are open to the public, like supermarkets. And that compliance officer is required to um, uh, really manage queues um, and behavior on queues and allow a limited number of employee uh, uh, customers into the premises um, and to monitor social distance in the, in the queues. But that is, again, an, a written appointment. And then there's a compliance officer who is responsible for the um, workplace plan and the and the implementation of that and the monitoring of that. So those are all new appointments that need to be made. Um, the uh, where you've got a safety committee, you're required to consult with that um, safety committee. Not all employers will have safety committees under the under the Act. We are saying on all health and safety matters, whether you've got a committee or not under the law, use an inclusive process to engage with your um, employees. Um, on the communication um, um, element, um, we've uh, um, clients have asked us how to, to what extent do they amend their uh, disciplinary code to uh, bring all the safety issues into it, and we say yes, that does need to be done. But over and above that, what you want to do is to sell the health and safety program and policies that you've got, explain the rationale behind that, and really try to promote self-motivation of um, employees. Um, and then lastly, the employees do have duties, and it's important to share that with them. It is, again, one of uh, obeying the health and safety standards and um, cooperating over that. And then um, lastly is this issue around vulnerable employees. And, Jakes, if I could turn to you and ask you to take us through the next slide, please. Uh, yes, uh, yes, Mike. In terms of the vulnerable employees, I think that uh, um, this is this is a responsibility that has been uh, put onto the employers, um, and there's two 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 particular categories. Uh, one is on the age aspect, and the other one is on on current illnesses or ailments that employees might have um, that could uh, put them more at risk than than healthy employees, for that matter. Hence, uh, the regulations are making uh, reference uh, to, to this particular part of vulnerable employees, whereby they are actually bringing employees, employers' attention uh, to this point that they need to take care of these employees as they're, as they're the most vulnerable. So I think uh, from, from that point of view, but we need to be very, very careful uh, the way we manage this, um, because we must, we must uh, really, you know, um, and understand what is differentiation versus discrimination. Um, and and um, so we identify employees that are 60 and above, which are your older employees. And your first bet would be try and make them work from home or, or at, a, at a, uh, a very safe distance from everybody else, because obviously their health is not as, as, as good as, as the younger generation. Um, that in no way means that they are not valuable employees. Um, so your first first uh, win would be having them work from home or remotely for that matter, uh, or, or actually keeping them at, at a safe distance um, and understanding exactly what the, the situation is. You need to consult with them. You need to find out, you know, it's acceptable, et cetera. But by no means must we discriminate and say, oh, you, you know, based on age per se. Um, the other side of it is, is employees that have got current ailments uh, and most, uh, most uh, uh, are pointing towards uh, the, uh, you know, tuberculosis and, and lung infection uh, or respiratory conditions for that matter. And we need to take note of that. Um, HIV and, and those type of illnesses, are, although it's risk, but it is not identified as a COVID risk at now uh, from a medical point of view. But our advice should be that uh, these employees should declare what they have. Uh, please maintain uh, confidentiality at all aspects, um, you know, in that respect. And, and refer them to a, a medical practitioner or healthcare practitioner 
that can give you uh, some sort of direction in terms of how to manage them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so at least you've taken note of that and please make sure that you note that in your registers as well that, you, that you've uh, considered these. Uh, what also gets a bit complicated is that in the event that these employees cannot perform their duties uh, based on their illness, um, then you've got to look at another process uh, which takes you into the incapacity ill health process uh, that you might have to consider where you would be going to your insurers uh, to actually look at uh, disability based on ill health. So it's, it's quite complex and, and you need to really apply a, a, a serious mind to this. Uh, however, what we need to do is, and I think the principle is that we need to take uh, uh, cognizance of these grouping of people called vulnerable employees. Super, Jackson. I'd like to just ask, answer a couple of questions. Um, yeah. There's an anonymous one is, can we get employees to disclose their illnesses to accommodate them uh, working remotely? Uh, uh, HIV uh, may be hard, but not um, asthma, etc. I think the, the you, employee is not obliged to disclose an illness. Uh, one wants to encourage them to do so um, and indicate the, the advantages of doing that. In other words, we can protect them. I think in the context of the uh, um, regulations and um, the regulations in particular supporting remote working that um, subject to the reasonableness test, you can instruct people to work from home. Um, and um, even if they don't want to, but um, if it is reasonable and obviously reasonableness is determined on the basis of your engagement with them. Um, but um, then uh, Sunita uh, asks, are employees expected to wear masks the whole time at the workplace? And the answer is yes. Um, John Ross McDonald has said, would a company with a national uh, footprint appoint one national manager and then have a compliance officer uh, per site? Um, I think the, the, um, um, the whole OSH Act uh, uh, amendments talk to a workplace um, and a workplace is an individual uh, operation. So the, I think that would need to be appointed at the individual operations. And I stress here, the management appointment here is to field concerns from the employees around health and safety and avoid people downing tools um, and saying we haven't provided a sufficiently um, uh, safe environment. Um, Um, Sunita says, are we required to pay employees if they fall under the high risk vulnerable category and cannot come to work? Um, it, uh, again, I think is a no work, no pay, but as uh, Jake's mentioned, it is a, um, an incapacity issue um, and certainly have a look at that very, very carefully. And I mean, I had a, a situation with uh, a client this week where an employee is undergoing cancer treatment and um, based on the, um, the person moving out of the geographic area and then coming back into it again, uh, the employer said, you've, you've got to isolate for 14 days. That's the internal policy. And the question is, is that sick leave or not? Um, and um, the management were totally and absolutely divided in that um, situation. Um, Gustav, you've asked about um, uh, um, COVID tours, um, um, applications. Can I ask one of my colleagues to get back to you a little bit later who's had a lot of experience in that regard and they'll answer that question for you. Okay, let's go on to the next slide please. Right, the, um, I mentioned earlier that the primary need of employees at this time is going to be over safeness and wellness and incorporated in there is obviously concerns about job security. And um, highlighting the remark that Jake's made a little bit earlier, how we treat employees during and how we care for them during the, the lockdown phase will influence how they care for the business when we restart. And what we're saying here is absolutely critical that we are open and transparent and proactive in conveying information to employees about the state of the business, your bounce back or resilience uh, factors, how long you think it's going to take you to get uh, up and going. Um, the uh, Look at the tours options, uh, the training layoff scheme and the uh, media UIF benefits coming out of the, the COVID-19. Um, those are options of providing ongoing UIF support. Uh, for employees during a period of, of inactivity. Um, but I mean, obviously at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's around affordability and um, 
the um, and how you manage that affordability um, during this time and spread that uh, resources. Um, the um, and I think if if it may be difficult to to give job security uh, undertakings to employees, uh, but I think what we can do is to is to give them some idea and at least allow them and help them to provision for the unexpected in the in the future, and then clearly follow the. Um, all the, the relevant processes should you get into the difficulty of having to look at terminating uh, employment. But see it as a, as a major, major issue and be open and, and truthful to employees, even although you can't actually get undertakings. Yeah, just to add on, Mike, I think, uh, and I think this is a concern of quite a few people as well, COVID-19 or the situation we find ourselves at hand does not negate your responsibility to follow due process that's set out in the LRA or the BCA for that matter. Please ensure due process is followed. Otherwise, it's, 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 uh, it's really going to come and bite you. Um, so, so and, and, and exercise caution during this time. You know, all processes did not stop. Uh, we just changed certain approaches, but your, your fundamental and your, your, your building blocks of your legal side uh, remains absolutely intact. And please make sure we follow that uh, to, to, to the team. Okay, super. Um, Jake, see, um, can you uh, pick up on the next one and just talk a little bit about remote working um, and just the frameworks of it? I'm also watching yes. time a bit. We've got another 12 minutes to go. All right. Uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, lots of research has been done in this, in this field uh, over, over the decade or, or, or over time uh, with, with mixed, uh, 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 mixed results, some, some for, some again, some uh, neither here nor there undecided. Uh, but, but this period has actually forced us to think our entire operations and businesses differently. Uh, how, and, and how to optimize that. And, and what we've proved is that uh, there has been various surveys that has been taken, taken uh, place uh, whereby uh, in terms of remote working and a large number of people have indicated that uh, it's actually the best thing and the best way to go. Uh, also the, the issue in terms of work-life balance that has come into being um, and further, you know, when you take travel and you take the expenses related to that, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, remote working seems to be uh, uh, really favored uh, going forward. And, um, you know, even if it's engineering firms or, or, or high, uh, high um, mining companies, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, there can be a percentage of your workforce that can work remotely. Uh, whilst the others, you know, obviously certain jobs cannot do that. Uh, you have to, you have to be within a certain environment to go, to operate. Uh, but that being said, uh, I think that it's a win-win situation from for both employees and employers, uh, in the sense that if you take these massive buildings that have been out there, uh, accommodating multi floors of of employees, etc. And when you take the issue of social distancing, uh, I think remote work, uh, remote working actually uh, finds itself as the as the meaningful solution. Also, from a cost point of view, when you take facilities and all of that, with companies and businesses being pressed on cost, uh, I think that uh, you know we, we have the firm opinion that uh, should companies actually promote and optimize remote working, they can actually save. Uh, on the bottom line and actually save jobs in that regard, uh, which, is, which is more especially where we're going to so that they can weather the storm uh, in terms of what is going on for the next 12 to 18 months. Um, and uh, there's, there's various learnings that have come through. Uh, I think remote working is going to be the way to go. Um, we've proved that. And uh, with the savings generated from companies in terms of allowing people to work from home, uh, people can invest in technology and upgrade the technology and works, workspaces within their home environments. Um, that, that is very, very possible. Um, and also, you know, when we talk about uh, reasonable accommodation and, 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 and things like that, um, you know, one needs to be flexible, one needs to approach that and uh, also set some rules in place. Uh, for example, between 12 and 1, there should be no meetings, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And these are things that will start to gradually develop uh, once you get into the thick of things uh, when it comes to that. But the savings uh, for the company is huge. 
the the work life balance for the employee is 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 absolutely spot on uh, spending time at home and not in traffic and you know the the traffic's in the city center most of us are within the Gauteng area uh, it takes us at least about an hour hour and a half just to get by to work and back uh, so all those times have been saved uh, companies can actually renegotiate with employees uh, in terms of timing work times and, and end times um, and and it's very very possible so um, we've we've, uh, we've we've done a lot of work in, in terms of this area and and uh, we will definitely uh, ensure um, you know if you need support in this regard we can provide that but it's for for everything is for remote working Mike Okay, super. Thanks, Jakes. Um, if I can add uh, just a couple of points to that, uh, the remote working fundamentally changes the nature of the employment relationship. Uh, and in a way, it's let the genie out the genie bottle. Uh, what one is doing is relying on trust. Or we are trusting employees and relying on them to execute the work remotely. And one cannot marry that with a traditional control and direction and supervision approach. It's a fundamentally different way of leading and engaging with employees. I think second, the uh, employers are still responsible for health and safety because the home becomes a, a working environment. And in particular, I think, look at uh, the ergonomics of um, the, the workplace. And then as Jake's mentioned, probably the employer will need to invest in uh, IT and other things to support employees working uh, remotely. And then um, I think all the studies have, and a lot of studies have demonstrated that uh, employees working at home are more productive. And Jack ex has explained that. If we can go on to the next slide. Um, and what we're do doing here is just really categorizing employees on the basis of their energy levels and their attitude towards work. And we'd say that over half of your employees are high performers, they don't need to be managed, uh, they perhaps just run, a, run ahead a little bit, we need to keep in touch with them, uh, keep them uh, motivated, but important to be promote communication. And then your, um, your spectators, your, these are really your very, very reliable people. Um, they are very, very positive, uh, but their energy levels slack a little bit. So one needs to just engage with them, communicate, keep them involved. Uh, have them report back on progress to be made. And those two groups collectively should make up around 60% of your, 65% of your workforce. And the ones at the bottom are the ones that you would need to manage on either misconduct or um, a poor performance uh, you know, basis. So treat the employees differently when they are working remotely, try and identify what drives them, what, what category they fall into, um, and deal with them appropriately. But I don't think you have to uh, have a high... Uh, Broad um, uh, disciplinary approach to employees working remotely. Yeah. I think let's go on to the um, the next slide. Um, I think we've really covered this um, in some of the conversation we've had, and in particular the the kickoff that we had with Shannon's uh, questions. Um, the regulatory environment is. Um, compelling and complex and detailed, and we need to get that uh, up and running and get on top of that. And there are lots of queries uh, around this, and I'll deal with some of them still. I think secondly, the health and safety issues will take time to put in, in place. And importantly, our supply chain processes may inhibit our um, activation of our economic activity. I think importantly, we said our employees are all healthy and eager to come back to work. In other jurisdictions, absenteeism because of um, infections or isolation or quarantine is a major, major issue. Um, and we'll need to factor that potential in uh, later in the, um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the year. Okay. Let's go on to the next um, um, slide, please. All right, what, um, uh, expanding on, on this whole issue of people centricity, um, what we have perhaps under L4 is a limitation on the number of people that we can bring back at any one time. And this could undermine our ability to perform work. We just don't have the number of employees um, available to do so. Um, and just to highlight that, where uh, under L4, for example, that you're allowed to scale up to 50% or 30% of your employees, uh, that number um, obviously doesn't count anybody who's working remotely. Um, so that's uh, over and above your, so you don't bring your remote workers into that percentage. Um, I think thirdly, um, the, there's no prohibition on you bringing in contractors and external service providers 
um, to assist you. So that can boost the, the 30% uh, limit, but be aware of the social distancing requirements where you have those additional people in the, in the workplace. Um, the presence of um, external service providers, and I've been very broad in the terminology there, service providers rather than just contractors, uh, but labor brokers must presumably come into, into play there as, um, as well. And you may get a lot of opposition where employees will say, well, why didn't you bring back other employees? Well, the L4 limits uh, gives us the, the answer to that. Um, hours of work um, are likely to be varied. Um, Multi-shifting, what the, uh, the regulations don't explain at this stage is a 30% back at only one time. And therefore, if you've got a continuous shift operation, are you able to double up on that figure? That's an uncertainty at this stage. I think it will be um, clarified. The regulations um, advance job rotation as an option. Um, I think in our experience, that's uh, a very, very difficult one to put into, into play. In other words, allow everybody to share in the available work that is um, there. I think you will need to look at, um, at skill sets required in order to um, activate your economic momentum. Um, and there may well be some upskilling in that regard. Um, what we have dealt with extensively, and I'll just mention these two, is um, reward levels, um, people asking to make salary sacrifices in the short term, short to medium term, that is by agreement. Um, um, and just remember that. Uh, fringe benefit holidays, particularly retirement fund contributions, the pension fund rules or the retirement fund rules will uh, dictate you how to do this and what you can do. But just to highlight that in some of the schemes, the employer contribution can come under the holiday, but not the employees, i.e., they will say to the employer, um, yes, you can have a, a contribution holiday, but you must give us an undertaking that you are paying the employee the equivalent of that contribution. Um, I think flexibility and adaptability, just generally speaking, is, a, um, is required through the regulations and the directives, i.e. how many people you can work, bring them back at different times, spread or stagger the, the starting times, can influence the hours of work, etc. Uh, can you give people instructions on that? Ultimately, we say yes, because it's giving effect to the uh, regulations um, and employees have an obligation to collaborate. Uh, obviously, going back to my earlier comment, do it in an inclusive manner, uh, but you get their input, allow them to influence the process and the decision that you, um, that you make. Um, okay. Um, Very good. Yeah. Next slide. Yeah. Just while we turn over to the next slide, the, um, one of the things that we could also do with regard to values, we mentioned earlier, empathy and um, urgency is innovation. Um, and just looking at that last slide, uh, the uh, bottom item was around transport. Uh, one of our clients um, went to one of the car hire uh, people and said, your vehicles are all stationary at the moment. Our employees want to get to work safely. What's the best deal you can give us? Um, and they got very, very favorable um, rates to um, allow um, employees to drive others to, to work, obviously with the um, limit on the number of people um, that can be accommodated. Okay, Jake, so I think we've got two slides to go and we've got- Yeah, I'll minutes. just run through this yeah. one, Mike. Um, I think, uh, uh, you know, as, as, as HR practitioners, IR practitioners, um, we need to ask ourselves, and this is not an exhaustive list, um, we, <clears throat> within the new normal, what, what, what is required from, from HR people at the end of the day? And we've just taken a few, few points here. Uh, for example, if you just take work from home or the leadership type required, the social compact retrenchment, your, your list could be you know, an exhaustive list as well. Uh, do a workshop, do something of that nature, and then discuss it specifically. For example, uh, if you have to take learning and development, um, just, uh, just as a point, uh, what has changed within that environment? You know, the training and development. What happens to 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 face-to-face uh, -face blended learning? Is all that going to come through to um, uh, online portals and online training? Are we ready for that? Do we have the necessary uh, uh, technology to support that? Have we can cancelled all training because social distancing is going to become the big thing? And, uh, uh, you know, it's a major change process that needs to take place from a learning and development point of view. Uh, if one is to take, for example, employee wellness, um, you know, that's taking center stage right now in terms of EAP. Um, are, we, are we ensuring that the employees are, are, are trained or, or given workshops in terms of financial fitness? 
personal budgeting and uh, you know um, responsible borrowing during this time? How do we help them in terms of uh, payment holidays from your uh, credit providers, etc.? What new policies and procedures need to change? Uh, Comp and Ben, you know, if you look at that, that's that's turned upside down in terms of how do we get Comp and Ben into the front line so that we could we could look at the various ways of repackaging uh, payments uh, or remuneration structure and move away from fixed remuneration to performance-based pays. So that's going to be a huge thing going forward. So there's various aspects within the HR framework that 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 has changed and has and, and some have changed fundamentally. So I think it's important that you need to just list your, 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 your major contributors towards the HR side and, and see how best you can manage that in terms of, of, of bites per se. Okay. Okay, super. Last slide, please. All right. The, um, what we've tried to cover is, is that the putting together the, um, uh, the safety plan and the uh, workplace ready plan involves many, many factors um, and uh, not only a compliance, but it's also aligning the HR practices and people to the, to the business. But in this last slide, what we've tried to do is to summarize all of that for you. Um, and the, um, so various appointments must be made in writing. Secondly, what plans that you need to have in place. And we do stress the business strategy and the operational plan, which you will share with the employees that we are faced with things we haven't done before. And quite a useful risk brainstorming is for us to ask not only how do we do things correctly, but where can it all go wrong? And interestingly, it's easier to think in the negative than in the positive. And they used this process when they went to the moon, uh, obviously, again, for the first time. So think in the ne negative, how do we stuff it all up? And then convert all of those into um, positive um, steps. Um, the OSH Act requires us to do um, risk assessments, look at the level, the numbers of employees impact, impacted, the measures that we will do to um, combat those. Um, we need to have a list of recalled or employees to be recalled and also attendance records. Um, our screening processes, uh, when people come into the workplace, again, we have to have record keeping, uh, the questions that we need to ask people when they enter the workplace, um, etc. Um, all of that must be recorded, um, induction detail, communication, PPE issuing and confirmation, uh, visitor records, who's come into the premises, uh, where our staff go outside, where do they go to and um, what record do we have of that. And when I go through all of that, and I ask myself, yes, you can have all the policies and the procedures and the piece of paper, but all of that still involves touching. Um, and is there some way of introducing some of this in an electronic uh, format? Um, so I have to, to we've come up to, to the 10 o'clock. I see there are a number of questions. Um, the, um, Shannon, can we carry on for a couple of minutes or are we? Um, yeah, are we can we just feel the questions quickly, Mike? I think we can do that verbally oh, with, okay. with permission. Yeah. You, you go for it. Uh, I think the first one is, is the, the medical, medical fees you. from, yeah, from John Ross. Do. I think, I think first prize would be the company pay for that. Um, you know, if they have an onboard clinic or onboard uh, medical facility, great. Um, further, you know, the medical aid can be utilized in this regard. However, if, if not, uh, then I guess last straw would be for the uh, employee to go and see a doctor, even at a public uh, clinic, uh, just to get some sort of direction in that regard. Right. I think, uh, uh, John Ross, if I understood your, your question there, is that you suspect somebody or somebody comes to you with uh, uh, says, I'm feeling ill, etc., and you now want that checked out. Does the company bear the responsibility for paying for that? Um, and I think if it goes to a public facility, obviously, um, you know, not. Um, but um, um, yeah, it will it fall under medical aid? Yes, it will. Um, if the person hasn't got the money to pay, well, yeah, maybe that is an expense to be picked up. Um, Second one is an anonymous phone call. Can we cover changes to employment uh, versus 189? Um, yes, you can. Um, it, one's looking at it, asking employees to cooperate, but if they don't cooperate, you'll have to go the 189 route. And there's lots of case um, uh, law on the, that you can introduce change to terms and conditions in order to survive the business going forward. Um, can you claim tours for vulnerable employees? That's an anonymous one. Um, 
I think you can. We'll need to check on that one. Um, Jake, so one there, um, there would need to be a firm policy change in respect of uh, remuneration benefits, flexi time. Um, yes. I think, I think uh, once again, you know, uh, uh, you know, firstly, determine exactly what you need to do in terms of remuneration. Um, and and uh, every aspect is going to, to need, um, you know, commitment and uh, consultation with, with employees, especially when it's a change in remuneration. Uh, but I think the, the, the fundamental that Mike has mentioned and, and what I've mentioned as well from the start is that it's a collaborative approach. Um, and, and all towards business uh, continuity and preventing job losses. So, you know, and, and that's, that's the, the point of departure in which we want to change remuneration, not to change the remuneration for the sake of changing it because it's mm -hmm. COVID time. Okay. Um, Sunita, you've asked a question. Um, if you have a vulnerable employee who insists on working, um, can you ask them to sign a waiver? Um, I think the answer to this one is if you are aware that the person has a, a vulnerability, a pre-existing uh, medical condition, you do the assessment and uh, determine whether or not the person um, should, can be accepted back into the workplace. Um, I wouldn't like to go the waiver route where a person is, is vulnerable and um, gives you an indemnity. I don't think that that's, um, that's effective um, at all. And um, think, just, to add to the, just to add to that, Mike, I think it's not just the employee, it's those around the employee as well. Yeah. It's a total workplace that we need to take into account. So signing, yeah. signing a waiver only, only sorts the employee out, but not those around them. So I would, not, I would not really accept a waiver. Thank you very much for joining us today. I think um, we're going to leave it at that. Uh, anything else from Michael Jakes in closing? No, I, th I said th thank you to everybody for participating. Yeah, on, on behalf of us as well, Mike, myself, and the group at HRIR, and thank you, Lexus Nexus. Thank you, Shannon, for facilitating this. Thank you, guys, for listening to us. We truly, truly appreciate it. And yes, all the very, very best, and stay safe. <laughs>